I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions. In those days I will pour out my spirit even on servants men and women alike. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved.
glad to be here with you this morning. You know, I miss you guys, and I miss your smiling face. But I brought with me this morning a picture of my little guy, Skylar, with that big smile on his face. I hope you're watching, Skylar, and can uh, be with us this morning. Now, before I start my children's time, I'd like to share a verse from Ephesians 4.16 that Pastor Dave will be sharing with you in his uh, message this morning. And it goes like this. From him the whole body joined and held together by very supporting ligaments grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Now, I want you to imagine your body this morning. It's like body of Christ. God has made us so magnificent that all of our body part, parts works as one. So if I were to tell you every one of the body parts this morning, we'd be here an awful long time. But what I want to share with you this morning is very one of the very important ones that I feel is, and that's your elbow. Now we all like to eat, and if we do not bend our elbow, then we can't get that food to our mouth. So I brought uh, something with me this morning to demonstrate uh, about the elbow. I brought this cup of water with me this morning. Now, if I would want to take a drink, it would be very hard for me to get the water to my mouth if I didn't bend my elbow. So if I put my arm straight out to the right, like this, and try to take a drink, I can't get it to my mouth. I could try it with my left arm, or I could hold it straight out in front of me. But no matter what position I put this cup in, I cannot get a drink of water. Now let me think. Maybe if I hold the cup above my head and aim it towards my mouth, I might be able to get a drink of water. So let's try that. Oh. Boy, am I glad there was no water in that cup and that it was full of yarn. Now, just like the body has all those parts and they all work together as one, the body of Christ is the same way. Now, you might have to do something different than what I would do in the church, but when we put them all together, we become one in Christ. We can make the church be a very big witness for the community and for the world if we just remember that there is just one body and we are all joined together for Christ to glorify his name. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you so very much for this day that we have been able to share together with our church members. We ask, Lord, for safety for them, that as they go into this next week, and as we begin to open up as a nation, Lord, that we continue to be safe and to glorify you as one in the body of Christ. Amen. Now, Skylar, I know right now what you'd be doing. You'd be running for that basket in order to get candy. So I brought a basket of candy with me today. And if you want a piece, you're going to have to stop by my house sometime this week. Greetings. It's the 11th, I can't hardly believe it, the 11th online message. And uh, what's exciting is uh, maybe we will not need to do another one because next Sunday, Lord willing, weather permitting, we're going to have an outdoor service both at Centennial and Bethel. We're going to meet in the back of the church uh, we're going to have a PA system there. If you need to stay in your car, you can. That's beautiful if you, you know, need the extra protection or whatever. And uh, you can wear a mask if you want to. If you don't want to, you don't have to because we're outside. And we're going to be able to sing because we're outside. So that, that's valuable. So uh, we're going to have a shorter service probably. We're, we're going to look at probably more like 30, 35 minutes would probably be as long as service will last. But I think that will all work to good because uh, we'll be able to more easily manage the service. So anyway, um, next Sunday, uh, consider that. We're supposed to go to Green on the 5th of June. 
and the 7th of June, hopefully we'll be outside. So I hope you can make it out to that. And again, for all those listening, I hope you're blessed by the message. Uh, it's sort of continuing on Pentecost. I kind of uh, was a little early on Pentecost. It actually does sort of start before the Sunday. Uh, this is part of Pentecost too, so we're going to be talking very much about how God has given us one plan through the power of the Holy Spirit. His plan when he left this earth was one thing, and the thing that we'd need, and in the way he said it, we'd be better off with it anyway, because he could be everywhere at once, was through the power of the Holy Spirit, and that one spirit makes us one in Christ, and one with the Father, and one with each other, and that gives us power. Uh, that unity gives us power in God. When we're one with God, we have power because we're one with everyone else that is with God. So there we are. And we're going to be learning about that. Now, behind me, we've got a slide talking about mentoring, empowering, training, and leadership. And those all blend together because that's what the Holy Spirit gives us. And how does that get packaged? How is that presented to the world and God's plan? How does he unfold that? Well, his one plan is the church, the local church, where we meet together to worship. And that is God's plan. There's no other. So we're going to be learning about that. Now, as, as we go into this next slide here, I want you to, to think about this. We're, we're, here we are. We're not supposed to socially connect, but here we are. We're, gonna, we're, we're going to uh, socially connect. Here. Okay, we see, we see a slide here back here. It's kind of cool. I like this. The guy reaching down. Uh, I guess uh, social distancing doesn't quite work there, but anyway, uh, I, I hope that that uh, uh, still communicates to you that we're connecting uh, with people, and we have one way to do that through service, through caring for each other, and that's what the Holy Spirit's all about. It's about empowering us to serve each other, and that's God's definition of greatness. Those who serve are great, and it's an amazing thing that everyone is given a gift. Everyone can be great, not because they have a degree, not because they have some special ability, but because every one of them is giving ability by God to serve someone else and to serve the body of Christ and, and to make people more like him and, and empower them to, be, um, to know him. And that's the service. The service works to that end. So here again, uh, we're going to be learning about that. Um, I got a slide here uh, coming up I really think is cool. Uh, Martin Luther King said something I think very significant, and, and I want to give him credit for that. So let's go to that slide now. And Okay, Martin Luther King said this, and I think he nailed something right out of Ephesians uh, 4 that I'm going to be reading here in a little bit. Um, but listen to this. Um, Martin Luther King said this, Everyone can be great. That's amazing because our society, our culture, our world fights against that. You have to be rich. You have to be amazingly talented. You have to uh, you know, be in the right place at the right time. And all these kind of things in worldly terms are necessary. But, but in Jesus' definition of greatness, how we become great is the greatest among us is the one who serves. And, and, and that means that everyone can serve someone so everyone can be great. That, that's, that's just so cool because everyone can serve. Uh, Martin Luther King nails it, okay? You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject or your verb agree to serve. You only need a heart full of grace. And again, that's unmerited love, okay? And undeserved love and undeserved kindness. A soul generated by love. Okay, that, that's just so cool. Um, he's, he nails it. And that's certainly what um, Ephesians and, and Corinthians that major on the gifts and how they work in the church. And this one plan all goes down to one thing, serving others, um, adding quality to other people's lives. And the greatest quality of all is connecting them with Jesus Christ and modeling to that person that we're serving what Jesus did for other people, how he served them, and, and healing and feeding and taking care of them and, and meeting their needs. And not only 
their physical needs, going beyond that, going to the, what their deepest, greatest needs are, and that's connection with God and significance and belonging to other people through God and, and having a place for everybody and having a place where everybody can be great because everybody can serve. So that's awesome. So let me get to the scripture here. So I'm going to begin with five, uh, verse 5 and go through 16. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, Father of all, who is over all and living through all. And again, that's so cool. The all and the everything and the one all go together here. However, he has given each one of us a special gift. Do you hear that? Each one of us. Everyone can be great. Everyone can have a gift. Everyone can serve. Through the generosity of Christ. And this is how he describes it here, uh, Paul does. That is why the scripture say, when he ascended to the heights, again, this is Jesus ascending from the earth, going to heaven. And like he said, when he does that, he's going to send the Holy Spirit. And Paul ties that in together where the psalm talks about this. It's prophetically spoken of his ascension, where that ascension would mean an outpouring of God's gifts on people. He led a crowd of captives and gave gifts to his people. That's us, his church. Notice that it says he ascended. This clearly means that Christ also descended to our lowly world. And at the same, and the same one who descended is the one who ascended higher than all the heavens so that he might fill the entire universe with himself. Now, these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. Again, this is the plan, but these are the differing ways that God's doing it. Now, listen closely. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors, and the teachers. And here it is. This is key. This is what their job is. This is my job. This is the job of, of those who are especially given to empower the church so that people can use their gifts so they can become great in their service. This is, this is the key here, is to equip God's people to do his work. So all are ministers, all are doing God's work. And, and the job of the pastor or, or those that are teaching or the apostle or the missionary or whatever is to equip, to coach, to direct, okay? So that people do his work and build up the church. So it's, it's, it's healthy. So people are adding quality to each other's lives. So how we serve together works together and creates the best result, okay? And is true and harmonious with Christ and who he is and what his words say. And that's their job to make sure that our work is in alignment with his words, okay? And who he is and his truths. So here it is. This will, will, this will continue until all come to such unity in our, in our faith and our knowledge of, of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord. And again, it's knowledge and faith are the key driving forces that shape us. It's what we believe. What we believe determines what we do and who we are. And, and that's, again, the job of, of, of the... the uh, uh, those who are given special gifts, especially to lead the church, okay? So here we are, so that we will measure up in by these beliefs, by what we truly hold to, what we're convinced of, will cause us to measure up to the full and complete standard of Christ. And, and, and listen to this. Then we will no longer be immature like children. Now, what, what's the danger? What is it that... Um, is central to the church and God's plan. What, what is so important? What is it that causes us to be childish and immature? Well, it's this. When, when we're blown around by every wind of teaching, by our beliefs, when our beliefs get weird, uh, when we believe anything, it says we won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. That's the world. That's the culture, guys. So let's, let's get this. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies 
So clever, they sound like the truth. Hey, doesn't that play well in our time? Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of the body, of his body, the church. Okay, so he's in charge. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. He does. This is his plan, not my plan, not, you know, if you're going by my plan, you're in dead trouble, you know, or anybody else's. This is Christ's plan. This is God's plan, okay? So this is his one plan. As each part does its own special work, this is his plan, it helps the other parts grow. It adds quality to their life. And the greatest quality of all is to know God and to live God and to act like Christ. Imagine a world of people that are just acting and living Christ. That's awesome, okay? So that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love, okay? And again, it's love, it's truth, it's health that's defined by the Bible. You know, everybody has their definition. You could plug in all kinds of things in there. Um, what Nazi Germany thought was health and wealth and love is a very different thing from what the Bible does. So we have to always be careful not to let the world define the terms of the scriptures, but let the Bible itself define what these things mean. So it's, it's very critical. And, that, and that's really my job to help you with that. So I hope I, I hope I can help you with that. Now, one of the things that, 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 that's so, so uh, uh, tricky about this is, is that in, in our running to, to find um, things that, that make us happy and, and fulfill our desires, we're so often tricked by that. It's, it's a very subtle thing that, that Satan is always trying to trip up what is Christ, what is the church. If it's God's one plan to have the church live out Christ and show Christ and to do Christ in this way with all these special gifts working to one purpose that we would represent Christ and live him out in this world, um, Satan's one plan is to destroy that, to pervert it, to sidetrack it, to distract it from that. So again, this is going to you know, bring us under fire in the culture. Jesus said, if, if the world hated me, do you understand that? The world system, the world values, the things that are common hated Christ. And he says, if they hated me, when you're doing me, when you're living me, they're going to hate you too. So we're going to find pushback. So in our choice not to be of the world, we're going to invite trouble from the world. And even though we have to be in the world and deal with that trouble, we still are able through the power of the Spirit, through the power of these gifts, to take care of each other, to build each other up, to add quality to each other's lives in a way that makes it possible for us to, to live in this world and to live in harmony and have a sense of peace and joy that the world can't take away. And that's what we're supposed to protect with each other. We're supposed to protect each other's joy and peace and, and relationship with Christ. We're, we're God's protectors of each other. And that's how we serve each other. And this church is supposed to be um, his body, which again, we take care of our body. Well, Christ takes care of his body. And he's the head. He gives us um, the words and the direction and the definition and the choices that we need to make. Not the world. The world isn't our head. Christ is our head. And the scriptures give us his words. So it's very important that we, we hang tight with Scripture and we, we stay true to that. Now, there was a story once of a, of a guy that was a salesman. And he um, was always running around in the city, really drove him nuts. He was tired of that city. And so he, he thought, well, i got, I got to see a change of life. It almost feels like now we're all sequestered and we're all charted, you know, tied up and not able to leave, not able to travel. Well, he decided, I'm going to travel. So he traveled. He, he went out. And, and again, he got out to a place in the country where he was like all alone, he thought. He thought, man, I got you know, nature all around me. Didn't have to worry about social distancing. There was no one around him. And he said, I'm just going to just drink in this countryside and forget about the city. 
And so there he was. He was just there, just really enjoying the day. And he couldn't believe it, though, that all of a sudden it sounded very close to him, this voice. And he says, boy, this voice said, boy, I really enjoyed my trip to France. The Eiffel Tower was wonderful. And he looked, and he didn't see anyone. And then again, yeah, and then I loved going to Japan. I mean, I, I, I could see a, just a different world, a different culture. It was like I went to a different planet. And he looked over, and the only, only thing near him was this horse. And he watched closely, and he says, yeah, and, and I, I really loved going down to uh, uh, Argentina and going to the coast and running into water. And, and, and he says, my goodness, that horse is talking. He says, I just can't believe it, you know. And he says, yeah, I love to travel. I've been all over the world. And the guy, before, he, he just couldn't believe it. And he says, well, I got, I got to find out who owns this horse. So he looked around. He saw where there was a road that led through the property there where the horse was. And he says, that must be his house. And so he followed the road. And sure enough, there was a house there. Got there. And he, he runs up to the guy and he says, mister, mister. You know, I gotta buy that horse. I mean, I, I I've never seen a horse like that. And the man said, "Well, sir, don't don't be too impressed with that horse, because he hasn't been to half the places he says." Well, there you go. Sometimes we miss the point. The most fantastic thing wasn't so much he went those places, but he could talk about them. Okay, in the same way, we often miss. God's grand design for life and for our world because we missed the more important point. And the most important point here is, is that this is God's one plan for existence, for us being alive, that we learn to connect. And that when we make God first, we make him the head of our life, the head of all that we do. When we make him the one who defines what is best for others, what's true for others, and that's very controversial in this culture. I'll tell you, there's a lot of things the Bible says that people think are just bad and wrong. And yet, when we really understand it, it's all for people's good. And we have to, we have to know how to do that. Sometimes our own desires are the very things that destroy us. Even the Buddha understood that. That quite often, it's, it's these desires that control us that lead us into bad choices. It's fear and other things like that that become absolutely damaging to persons and cause people to damage other persons. We see that all over the place. But the Bible is always there trying to give us the mind of Christ, the head of Christ. It's always there trying to communicate to us, to conform to his word and will, to understand God and his purpose. And that's how God decided to do it. He decided to do it through these words. Now, God has unity to those words. There's a oneness to it. And again, that ultimately is fulfilled now until Jesus comes in his church, in the body of his people. And we are to be doing that ministry, that work to help other people to know him. And, and we need to not be tricked into missing the real meaning, the real importance of this life. And understanding, for example, that service is greater than being served. The greatest one is the one that serves everybody. Isn't that ironic? That goes against the world. But if we understand that, that means everyone, just like Martin Luther King said, everyone can be great. It's not based upon the world's standards or how they measure things. It's based upon God's standards. Whether we love someone. I remember one of the most powerful things I saw, and it was one of the things that led me into ministry, was seeing this movie about uh, St. Francis and his life. And it, it, was, it was so powerful. And, and in the movie, it had them rebuilding this old destroyed chapel. And in the movie, they had this young woman who had no arms and no legs and just sat in the corner. And his friend came to see them rebuilding this thing, and it was in the winter, and, and, you know, harsh conditions, but nobody seemed to be upset. And this woman was sat in the corner there, and, and he couldn't quite understand what she was doing there. And then she looked 
at St. Francis' his good friend, and he was watching her, and then she would tilt her head, and he'd say, you know, and he'd move a rock, and then she said, yeah. She was helping him line up the rocks on the wall, which became, again, a metaphor for what the church was, that everybody there had a special place. Everybody there was significant, even though the world thought they were castaways or useless or just meant to be pitied. But God gave them special purpose. And that's exactly what Jesus gave us when he went to heaven and he sent the Holy Spirit upon us. Each one of us, every one of us, who really love and know the Lord, he gives this to, he gives these gifts to his people. Okay, the ones who believe in him and trust in him and, and, and they'll have a special place and they need to work together. And the coaches and the trainers and those that are supposed to help are the apostles, the prophets, the, the uh, teachers. Um, those are given special importance. Now it goes on to say there's other gifts like, um, again, they teach us things like whether it be speaking in tongues as a form of worship, personal worship, interpretation becomes a way to teach people. A word of knowledge may guide someone, miracles of healing and stuff like that. Obviously, Jesus did, and they, they were significant, but they were always driven by his teaching. And the main important thing wasn't so much that someone got healed, as wonderful as that was. It was that they got to know God, and they knew God loved them, and they had a relationship with God. Because those eyes would die. Those feet would go lame again because we're all going to die. We're all going to get sick and old, and we're going to die. But when we're connected by Christ, we live forever. So again, that's the grand purpose of the church, is to bring everybody into that everlasting relationship with God for eternity. And even now, his plan is working in this message, in, in our connecting with each other and our caring about each other. So let God fulfill that in your life. Find your place to serve, and we'll help you, and we'll connect to do that. So, Lord willing, we'll connect in a special way this next Sunday when we get together. But wherever we are, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we are connected, and we can pray for each other and make a huge difference. So let's never forget that everyone's significant when they give their life to God. Do it, and watch what God does with us. Amen. Oh, let the Son of God enfold you with His Spirit and His love. Let Him fill your heart and satisfy your soul. Oh, let Him have the things that hold you and His Spirit like a dove. Will descend upon your life and make you whole. Jesus, oh Jesus, come and fill your lands. Jesus, oh Jesus, come and fill. As your hearts are filled with joy, lift your hands in sweet surrender to his name. Oh, give him all your tears and sadness, give him all your years of pain, and you'll enter into life in Jesus' name.